أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد والثناء لله رب العالمين ثم الصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد ولعنة الله على أعدائهم ومنكر فضائلهم من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي ثم أما بعد فقد قال الله تعالى في محكم كتابه بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وكذب به قومك وهو الحق قل لست عليكم بوكيل لكل نبء مستقر وسوف تعلمون صدق الله العلي العظيم صل على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد الله سبحانه وتعالى in سورة الأنعام verses 66 to 67 he says addressing the Holy Prophet, and your people have denied it, they have rejected it. While it is the truth, say, O Muhammad, I am not a guardian over you. For every tiding, there is an appointed term, and soon you shall know. Now, we know that this surah, as we mentioned in our first session, was revealed during the late Meccan period. And therefore the primary audience of this surah are the Meccans, the Quraysh. And we know that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa after 13 years of preaching, 12 years in this case, he was only able to recruit a small number of followers, the vast majority of his community, of his qawm, rejected his message. They rejected the notion of monotheism. They vehemently opposed the values and the principles of so social justice that the Holy Prophet was trying to introduce. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making a declarative statement. وَكَذَّبَ بِهِ قَوْمُكْ That O Muhammad, your community has rejected your message. وَهُوَ الْحَقْ Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding the Prophet that their rejection has nothing to do with you. It is the truth. The message that you have conveyed to them is a reflection of what is reality. It is the truth. Their rejection of the message has nothing to do with you as the messenger and it has nothing to do with the message. قُلْ لَسْتُ عَلَيْكُمْ بِوَكِيلٍ O Muhammad, tell them, tell your community who has rejected you that I, have, I am not a guardian over you. Now it may seem from the perspective of the disbelievers that Muhammad has failed in his mission. Because the majority of us have opposed him. We have not joined his faith. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet, tell them that I am not a wakil over you. I'm not your guardian. Do not measure my success by how many people join me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet, tell them that I am not a guardian over you. Now what does this mean exactly? Because there are many verses in the Qur'an where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reiterates to the disbelievers that my messenger is not a wakil over you. One example, there are many examples, but just, just to cross-reference one verse where the same message is being conveyed. If you go to Surah Al-Isra, which is the 17th surah of the Qur'an, verse 54. Allah in this ayah also emphasizes that the Prophet is not a guardian 
over the community that he was sent to guide. Allah says, Rabbukum a'lamu bikum. Your Lord knows you best. In yasha' yarhamkum wa in yasha' yu'adhibkum. Because Allah knows you, He knows all of us, He knows whether to show us mercy or to punish us. And then at the end of this ayah, Allah says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ عَلَيْهِمْ وَكِيلًا O oh Muhammad, we have not sent you as a wakil, as a guardian over them. Now, this statement by the Prophet, and in many verses in the Quran, where the Prophet is told to tell his community that I am not a guardian over you. Other verses where Allah says, my messenger is not a guardian over you. These statements indicate that the Prophet's duty is only to convey the divine message. Rasulullah's job is to convey the message, to clarify where there, where there needs to be clarification, to elaborate where there needs to be elaboration. His primary function is to convey the divine message. Again, if you go to Surah Al Ra'd, verse 40. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again, He says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, We may show you, O Muhammad, the fulfillment of some of our promises. And we may choose to make you depart this world before you see the fulfillment of the divine promise. فَإِنَّمَا عَلَيْكَ الْبَلَاغِ وَعَلَيْنَا الْحِسَابِ Again, Allah is telling the Prophet that you are not responsible, you are, you are not held accountable for the results. Allah says, your job is to convey, my job is to judge. Hisab is on me, balagh is upon you. So again, when the Holy Prophet says, Lestu alaykum bi wakil. It's indicating and reminding the disbelievers that do not measure my success by how many people I'm able to recruit. Because my job is to convey. So Rasulullah was never responsible for the acceptance or rejection of the message by his people. This is their own moral responsibility and matters of guidance are ultimately in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's hands. And this is an important reminder for us. If Allah is telling the Prophet that you, you have no authority over whether you are not responsible for their guidance or their disbelief. We as parents, we as community members, just as Rasulullah's job is to convey, our job as believers by extension is to convey, to remind, we're also not responsible for the results. We're responsible for the effort. So guidance is ultimately in Allah's hands. If you go to Surah Yunus, which is Surah number 10, verse 100, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا كَانَ لِنَفْسٍ أَن تُؤْمِنَ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ It has not been for a single soul. There is no soul that can believe without Allah's permission. Meaning, guidance has to happen with divine permission. Allah has to facilitate it. If Allah sees that there is a desire to be guided, Allah guides. So Allah guides those who wish to be guided. And only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is privy to that information. Because a desire to be guided is a matter of the heart. And only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what is in the hearts of people. And therefore, He is the one who takes that, takes upon that responsibility of guiding or keeping individuals in a state of misguidance.
And then in the next ayah, لِكُلِّ نَبَئٍ مُسْتَقَرٍ The word naba should be familiar to you because there is a surah in the Qur'an called Surah an naba Now, in the Arabic language, the word naba literally means news, important news. But in Arabic, there's another word that also means news, and that is khabar. So you have the word naba and you have the word khabar. Both of them mean news. But what's the difference? You know, as we know, Arabs, their language was very refined. The word naba refers to a, a type of news, information that when you hear it, when it reaches you, it demands a response, an action. There are two types of news. There's news that you receive and you can just be passive. It doesn't necessarily require action on your part. And then there's another type of news that when you receive it, it demands a response. It demands action. So for example, khabar, if we're told that there they found water on Mars, this is khabar. But does it demand any action on my part? Should I get on a spaceship and go to Mars? No. It doesn't necessarily require action on my part. But if I tell you, for example, there's a fire in the building, that's news that demands action. What is the action? That you remove yourself from that building. So here, Allah says, لِكُلِّ نَبَئٍ مُسْتَقَرٍ Every tiding, every naba has an appointed term. Now, in this context, the meaning of the news, the tiding, that has a fixed setting, a fixed term, is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala issues a warning through his prophets. This is a period of time during which the warning is operative. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns a community through his prophet or his messenger, that time period where that warning is issued, there's a fixed time. So it's the time period during which the warning is operative and after that what was what has been warned will come to pass and this is done to offer human beings the chance to repent for example i'll give you a very simple example when the community of lut alayhi salatu wassalam when they were engaged in the in the immoral act when they were engaged in homosexual behavior Lut warned them that they have to abstain or else divine punishment will descend upon them. But when did the divine punishment descend? Immediately or were they given until the following morning? They were warned and the adab came at the time, close to the time of dawn. When the warning was issued, and the punishment descended, that time period is known as Al-Naba'ul Mustaqil, Al-Mustaqal. That is the warning that has a fixed time period. Meaning, if there was anyone in the community of Lut that made Tawbah during that time period, before the punishment descended, Allah would have accepted their repentance. You find that oftentimes, Allah does not immediately punish communities. The warning is issued and there is a specific amount of time given. During that time period, this is an opportunity, a grace period for the sinner to return and repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But that time is fixed. It's not going to last forever. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you that opportunity if you persist and you stubbornly continue the punishment will descend Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says every tiding has a appointed term and soon you shall know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Mecca he was warning the Quraysh he was warning the disbelievers to refrain from slandering and abusing the Prophet to refrain from mocking the divine signs and the divine communications Allah tells them to listen the communities before you they were given warnings they were given and they ignored my warnings and the punishment descended Allah is telling them don't fall into the same don't fall into the same hole you have an opportunity now to repent and then Allah says very soon you shall know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here warns them that the punishment for rejection for rejecting the Prophet's message is imminent that this is not something that might happen if we oppose the Prophet if we fight the messenger this is something that will definitely happen it's only a matter of time now some commentators of the Quran they say very soon you shall know this is a reference to the battle of bed because this is when the disbelievers were punished they used to bully and persecute the Muslim community for 13 years 14 years Rasulullah migrates to Medina they continued to reject until the battle of Badr where the disbelievers faced a crushing defeat Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns them that you're not going to destroy this religious movement you will be destroyed and they were indeed crushed in the battle of Bad. other scholars say no this was so fatalamun refers to the conquest of mecca that yes the battle of Badr was a great victory it was a very historic moment in the early history of islam it firmly established the community the muslim community as a formidable force but the real victory was when rasulullah and the muslims conquered mecca as allah says in the quran the fat the conquest was the conquest of mecca the same messenger and his small group of followers who were banished who were driven out of mecca they return and they conquer mecca as victors allah says remember the warning that i gave you to refrain from attacking my prophet and his followers now they are exercising power over you other scholars have said that soon you shall know it means that when death comes to you you will know the reality of the warnings that the messenger issued and others say they know it's a reference to the day of judgment but you can one could postulate that it could encompass all of these things wasofa ta'lamun could be a reference to the battle of Badr, the conquest of mecca death and qiyamah these are all instances where the disbelievers come to know the truth behind the divine warnings that were issued to them then in the next ayah ayah number 68 Allah says in ayah number 68 of Surah Al-An'am, and when you see those 
who engage in vain discussion about our signs, then turn away from them until they engage in another discourse. If Satan makes you forget, then after remembering and after recollection, do not sit in the company of the wrongdoers. This is an interesting ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is instructing the Prophet and the believers to not sit in the company of those who are engaging in vain discussion. You know, today when we go to, so keep in mind that this, I, this surah, as we know, was revealed in Mecca. Many of the Muslims were going to Masjid al-Haram to supplicate, to perhaps do tawaf, to perform certain rituals, to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, when they enter into Masjid al-Haram, Masjid al-Haram is it occupied by Mu'mineen. In fact, at that time, when you go into the, the, the Holy Mosque, you would see gatherings of Kuffar. Kuffar were the main attendees in Masjid al-Haram during this time. And many of them, because Islam was the new thing in town, many of them would sit together and they would mock. They would talk about God. They would speak about the religion of Islam in a very disrespectful and disparaging manner. So here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the believers that do not sit with these individuals. Now, keep in mind, many of these Muslims had family members who were probably engaging in, in, in this vain talk, who were speaking ill about the religion of Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells them, when you see those who engage in vain discussion with respect to our signs, turn away from them. Do not sit with them until they change the subject. Because if you sit with people who are speaking blasphemy, it may be seen as a condonement of that behavior. You have to take a very firm position, a very firm stand when it comes to these matters. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is warning the Holy Prophet and the believers that do not, you know, have the mentality that let, let's just, you know, go along to get along. That when it comes to your deen, do not sit with those who make a mockery of my ayat. If you go to Surah at tawbah verse 65, again, there is a reference to this behavior. Now you can imagine that the kuffar are not sitting together and having, you know, serious religious deliberation and having debates and discussions. What they're doing is they're just mocking and they're ridiculing the prophet and his message and God himself and the prophets. So if you look at ayah number 65 from Surah at tawbah the ayah says, Wala in If you ask them why they utter blasphemous words why do they speak about god and this faith with disrespect their response will be that we were just joking we were just mocking allah says O oh muhammad tell them that they're taking this this matter of religion as a joke are you mocking God and His signs and His messenger? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is highlighting that religion should not be taken as amusement, as a diversion, 
as a joke. In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Mu'minun, when he describes the believers, he describes them as those who avoid vain discussions, discussions of lagu, discussions that bring no benefit, that have no use, that are not constructive. Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنِ اللَّغْوِ مُعْرِضُونَ The believers, the mu'mineen, are those who avoid engaging in vain discourse, useless conversations. Now, we have many ahadith from the Ahlul Bayt, alayhimu salam. Here in this ayah, we're told who we shouldn't sit with. Conversely, we have many ahadith that tell us who we should sit with. Because who you associate with, my dear brothers and sisters, has an impact on your spirituality. Luqman, the wise Luqman, who's mentioned in the Quran, Ahlul Bayt, السلام, they tell us that Luqman used to say to his son, Ya Bunay, O my beloved son, Jalis al Ulama, O my son, sit in the company of Ulama, of godly scholars. Wazahimhum bi rukbataik. Look at this expression. He says, don't only sit with in their company, he says, sit in a way where your knees are touching their knees. Figuratively speaking, Luqman is saying that when you're with ulama, be very close to them. When you're at a gathering with them, try to sit close to them, develop a very close relationship with them so you can benefit from them. And then he says, فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ عَزَّ وَجَلْ يُحْيِي الْقُلُوبِ بِنُورِ الْحِكْمَةِ كَمَا يُحْيِي الْأَرْضَ بِوَابِلِ السَّمَاءِ Luqman says, O oh my son, sit with scholars and put your knees close to their knees. Be very close to ulama. Why? Because Allah Azza wa Jal revives the heart with wisdom. Wisdom revives the heart in the same way that rain revives the dead earth have you seen during the spring season when the rain begins to fall and you see the the flowers blossom and the the plants begin to sprout we see this every year luqman says the heart comes to life when it is exposed to wisdom and the people of wisdom are the ulama so Jalis al-Ulama, be in the company of scholars. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is issuing a warning to the believers that you have just joined this faith. Because many of these individuals, they're new Muslims, they're new converts. You know, when someone converts to Islam, the best advice that we give them is what? Establish connections with other Muslims. Come to the mosque. Put yourself in an, in an environment where you're able to develop yourself, where you're able to grow, where you're able to nurture your heart and your soul. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is telling the mu'mineen who from a spiritual standpoint they're still in their infant stage, spiritually speaking. So don't put yourself in these, these, in, these pollutive environments. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns us that being around people who don't pay attention to what they say, who are not careful with their tongues, being in their company is very damaging. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you go to Surah An-Nur, which is Surah number 24, verses 14 to 16, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
speaks in very strong terms about the prohibition of, of speaking in vain discussion with matters of religion and law, that taking religions not serious, taking it very lightly, whatever you hear, you convey. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, listen to these verses. وَلَوْلَا فَضْلُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ وَرَحْمَةُ This is ayah number 14 from Surah An-Nur, Surah 24. وَلَوْلَا فَضْلُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ وَرَحْمَتُهُ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ لَمَسَّكُمْ فِي مَا أَفَضْتُمْ فِيهِ عَذَابٌ عَظِيمٌ Allah says, and if it had not been for the favor of Allah upon you and His mercy in this life and the next, you would have been touched by a great punishment for what you have spoken. What you say, brothers and sisters, has an effect on you, and it has an effect on the people around you. And then in the next ayah, if تَلَقَّوْنُهُ بِأَلْسِنَتِكُمْ وَتَقُولُونَ بِأَفْوَاهِكُمْ مَا لَيْسَ لَكُمْ بِهِ عِلْمٍ وَتَحْسَبُونَهُ هَيِّنًا وَهُوَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ عَظِيمٌ Allah says, you catch things with your tongue and you speak it with your mouths. You speak about things that you have no knowledge of. How many times have you sat with people and they have, they're not scholars, but they speak about matters of religion with authority. As if they have, as if they are ulama who have dedicated the entirety of their lives to the to the acquisition of knowledge, like as if they've spent their entire lives studying. They speak about things that don't concern them. They speak about areas that are not areas of their expertise. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "You consider it light." You think it's very trivial to just say whatever you want about matters that you don't have knowledge of, to attribute things to God. How many times have we seen people speak on God's behalf? Allah says, you take it lightly, but with Allah, it is something very great. And then Allah says what in ayah number 16? وَلَوْلَا إِذْ سَمِعْتُمُوهُ قُلْتُمْ مَا يَكُونُ لَنَا أَن نَتَكَلَّمَ بِهَذَا Allah says, what you should have done is that when you hear something that you don't know about, you should say that we do not have, it is not befitting for us to speak on this matter because we're not experts or it doesn't concern us. Just because you hear about something, it doesn't mean that you have to convey it. There's a hadith that says, it is enough for you to be labeled as a liar if you convey everything that you hear. You don't have to pass on everything that you hear. Allah says, when you hear something, the real believer says that, I'm not in a position to speak about this topic, either because I'm not an expert, or it doesn't concern me. مَا يَكُونُ لَنَا أَن نَتَكَلَّمَ بِهَذَا سُبْحَانَكَ هَذَا بُهْتَانٌ عَظِيمٌ It is a great buhtan. It's great slander for you to just say anything that comes on your tongue, anything that is brought to your attention. So this verse indicates that vain discussion in matters of religion and law can have serious consequences for the community. It can lead to false accusations. It can lead to distrust among people. So we have to be very careful about what we say, and we should never sit in gatherings where people are engaging in lahu. Allah says to the believers that you can only sit in a gathering when they change the subject, when they're not speaking in a disrespectful manner, in a disparaging manner. So this ayah, this verse, counsels the Holy Prophet and the believers by extension to avoid or remove themselves 
from groups engaged in vain discussion about religious matters. And this specific verse was in reference to the disbelievers who were speaking very rudely and very disparagingly about God, about faith. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you are not permitted to sit with them until they change the subject. If you go to Surah An Nisa, verse 140, again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, وَقَدْ نَزَّلَ عَلَيْكُمْ فِي الْكِتَابِ Allah has revealed in the book, this is a divine commandment. And إِذَا سَمِعْتُمْ آيَاتِ اللَّهِ يُكْفَرُ بِهَا وَيُسْتَهْزَأُ بِهَا فَلَا تَقْعُدُوا مَعَهُمْ حَتَّى يَخُوضُوا فِي حَدِيثٍ غَيْرِهِ إِنَّكُمْ إِذًا مِثْلُهُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that it has been revealed in the book that if you hear individuals rejecting the signs of God, they're not, it's not an academic discussion. It's rude. It's, it's a discussion of mockery. It's a discussion of disparagement. If God is being mocked and ridiculed and Allah is being rejected, فَلَا تَقْعُدُوا مَعْهُمْ Do not sit with them. In fact, Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq he also says that if anyone is speaking ill about Ahlul Bayt, if, if anyone is slandering Ahlul Bayt, the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, this also applies. You don't sit with them. You disassociate yourselves from these people. Do not sit with them until they change the subject. If you don't, if you continue to sit with them, إِذَن مِثْلُهُمْ Allah says in the Quran, if you if they continue to mock God's signs and they continue with their vain discussion and you sit with them, Allah says you are one of them. You are liable in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's hands. You have a responsibility to remove yourself from that gathering or at least make an effort to change the subject. If you're not able to, you remove yourself from that environment. And then in the, the next part of the ayah, the second part of ayah number 68, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses the Prophet. And he says, If Satan makes you forget, if he makes you forget this rule, this law, about not sitting with individuals who engage in vain discussion about matters of religion, who mock, who ridicule God and his, his faith. If you forget, if Satan makes you forget this, Do not sit. The moment you remember, do not sit with them. Remove yourself and do not sit with the wrongdoers. Now, when you read this ayah, the question that naturally arises, is Shaytan able to make the Prophet forget? This sparked a discussion among ulama for many generations. Because the verse clearly is addressing the Prophet. وَإِمَّا يُنْسِيَنَّكَ الشَّيْطَانِ If Satan makes you, who's you? The Prophet. If Satan makes you forget, then after recollection, when you remember the ruling, do not sit in the company of the wrongdoers. Now, There are two groups here. I'm speaking about Shia Ithna Ashari scholars. Shaykh al Tabrasi, for example, one of our prominent ulama, who is a theologian, theologian in his own right, 
He says that prophets cannot forget when it comes to matters of conveying God's message because that would render them ineffective. They wouldn't be able to fulfill their duty if they're able, it, we would, it would shake our confidence in them as messengers and as prophets if we're doubting whether or not they're forgetting to convey God's message to us. So when it comes to conveying God's message, prophets are immune from forgetfulness. Sheikh Al-Tabrasi says, however, there's no problem if prophets forget in areas that are not related to religious legislation. This is his opinion. However, the overwhelming majority of Shia Ithna Ashari theologians, they say prophets are not even allowed to forget outside of the realm of religious legislation. Why? Because that will also shake our confidence in them. If a prophet forgets things in his personal life, who's to say that they're not going to forget in other matters? So in order to give us full confidence and in order for us to not have an argument against Allah on the Day of Judgment, they have to be guarded from all types of forgetfulness that would shake our confidence in their ability to act as teachers and guides for humanity. So the scholars, they say that when Allah addresses the Prophet in this ayah and he says, if Satan makes you forget, in the Arabic language, this is very common, where you address someone, but the message is not meant for the addressee, it's meant for someone else. There's an expression in among the Arabs that say, that I am speaking to you, but I want the servant to hear. So for example, if a teacher knows that there's a student that, ha that has cheated on the exam, and they know the student who has cheated, they don't address the student directly, they address the entire class, but the message is meant for the student, that specific student. So here, Allah is addressing the Prophet because he's the primary recipient of the revelation, but the message is meant for the, the community of the believers. So Allah is addressing them through the Holy Prophet. Now, the question is, does shaytan whisper to prophets or does iblis only focus his attention on individuals who are not prophets if you look at surat al-hajj surah 22 verse 52 allah says wa ma min min and we have not sent before you any messenger or any prophet whenever the prophets have resolved and they desire to do something shaytan tries to cast vanity in their hearts he tries to spoil their niyyah their intentions who this is shaytan trying to attack messengers and prophets فَيَنْسَخُ اللَّهُ مَا يُلْقِ الشَّيْطَانِ but Allah nullifies and he abolishes the satanic whispers ثُمَّ يُحْكِمُ اللَّهُ آيَاتِهِ Allah strengthens his revelation وَاللَّهُ عَلِيمٌ حَكِيمٌ so here Allah tells us very clearly that Iblis is relentless. Talk about being ambitious. He doesn't just try to deceive your average Joe. He goes after 
God's prophets. He tries to deceive them. Allah says he fails, but the point is, look at how ambitious Iblis is. He doesn't settle for mediocrity when it comes to misguiding humanity. He goes for the kill, as we say. He tries to he tries to lead astray the most elite. Iblis has ambition. How come we as believers, how come we don't have ambition? So Shaytan whispers and he tries to tempt and he tries to cause them to deviate, but the prophets are firmly established on the straight path. وَمَا and ayah number sixty-nine. وَمَا عَلَى الَّذِينَ يَتَّقُونَ مِنْ حِسَابِهِمْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ وَلَكِنْ ذِكْرَى لَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَّقُونَ And those who fear God, those who have taqwa, the pious, are not held accountable for the for the disbelievers at all, but only a reminder that perhaps they will fear Him. Even if the people of taqwa temporarily find themselves among those who are engaged in vain discussion, you know, many of them could be family members, could be relatives. Sometimes you may be sitting with the kuffar and discussing certain issues, and then they start engaging in this vain discussion. They start mocking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands everyone else that the moment that happens, you leave. There's only one group where Allah says, you leave, but I give you the responsibility of advising them. And that is who? The people of taqwa. Not everyone is qualified to give advice. Not everyone is qualified to give admonishment, to invite people towards the truth. Only who? The people who have taqwa. Not, not, not just a Muslim, not just an average believer, those who are God conscious, who have taqwa, who are highly cautious when it comes to their spirituality, they are the ones who are charged with the responsibility of reminding and admonishing those who are engaged in vain discussions. Then if you go to the next ayah, so you see how much emphasis we find in the Quran about who we spend our time with, who we have in our company. There's a beautiful hadith from Imam Zain al Abidin salawatullahi alayhi where he says, You have to be very particular about who you spend your time with, about who you choose to have in your company, in your presence. Imam Zain al Abidin, he says, The gatherings of the pious, of the righteous, invites you towards righteousness. If you want to motivate yourself, to be a better human being, to be righteous, to be God conscious, you need to surround yourself with people like that. You need to be in the company of the righteous. There's a hadith from the Holy Prophet ﷺ where he says, لا تجلسوا إلا عند كل عالم يدعوكم من خمس إلى خمس. The Holy Prophet says, do not sit in the company of any scholar except the scholar that invites you towards five things away from five other things. <inaudible> Sit with the one who invites you from doubt into certainty, who invites you from doubt to certainty. وَمِنَ الرِّيَاءِ إِلَى الْإِخْلَاصِ Who invites you to sincerity and away from 
Riya from showing off. Who invites you min al-raghbati ila rahba Who invites you from desire towards the fear of Allah. Who invites you min al-kibri ila tawadu. Sit with people who invite you towards humility from arrogance. وَمِنْ الْغِشِّ إِلَى nasiha. Sit with those who invite you towards honesty and away from deceit. So we have to be very picky about who we associate with. Then in the next ayah, in ayah number 70, وَذَرِ الَّذِينَ اتَّخَذُوا دِينَهُمْ لَعِبًا وَلَهْوًا وَغَرَّتْهُمُ الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا وَذَكِّرْ بِهِ أَنْ تُبْسَلَ نَفْسٌ بِمَا كَسَبَتْ لَيْسَ لَهَا مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ وَلِيٌّ وَلَا شَفِيعٌ وَإِنْ تَعْدِلْ كُلَّ عَدْلٍ لَا يُؤْخَذْ مِنْ لَا يُؤْخَذُ مِنْهَا أُولَئِكَ الَّذِينَ أُبْلِسُوا بِمَا كَسَبُوا لَهُمْ شَرَابٌ مِنْ حَمِيمٍ وَعَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ بِمَا كَانُوا يَكْفُرُونَ It's a very long ayah. Allah says, so in the previous ayah, Allah says, do not sit with those who are engaging in vain discussion, who are mocking Allah's signs, who are speaking about faith and religion in a disrespectful and disparaging way. Here Allah gives us another group of people who we, sh who we shouldn't sit with, who we should stay away from. Allah says, leave alone those who take their religion to be mere play and amusement and are deceived by the life of this world but proclaim that every soul delivers itself to ruin by its own acts it will find for itself no protector or intercessor except allah if it offered every ransom, none will be accepted. Such is the end of those who deliver themselves to ruin by their own acts. They will drink boiling water and for punishment one most grievous for they persisted in rejecting Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this ayah is telling us there is another group of people that you should be very wary of, that you should not associate with, that you should not be in the company of. And that is those who take their religion as la'ib and lahu, that take it as play and amusement. Now there are several types of people who can fall into this category. The first is those who don't take their religion seriously. Religion is the furth furthest thing from their minds. There are people that are devoid of faith. Number two, those who follow religions that are themselves nothing but folly, like the idolaters, those who follow man-made faiths. The third is those who issue religious verdicts based on their own whims. They don't take religion seriously. They make halal whatever they want to make halal and they make haram whatever they see as unpleasing or undesirable in their eyes. There are also those, another group that the Mufassireen mention is the ones who take religious festivals that are ordained by Allah like Eid al-Adha, Eid al-Fitr, Eid al-Ghadir they don't look at them as religious occasions. They take them just as opportunities to have a party. Have you seen people? They're not religious. You only see them on, on Eid. For them, religion is just about attending festive occasions, just opportunities to have fun. That's all religion is to them. It's another event on their calendar another day that they can celebrate and have a good time and finally those who support religion to attain worldly ends meaning they use religion 
as a tool to acquire dunya. These are people who take religion as la'ib, as lahu. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, avoid these people. Because these people will have an impact on your soul. Treat these people the same way that you treat a non-mahram. Be very cautious with them. Don't be too comfortable with them. Don't spend too much time with them. Be very formal with them. Then in the next ayah, and you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this ayah, later on in the ayah, he speaks about the idea that in the hereafter, any punishment that you see was a result of your actions. You drove yourself to ruin. You drove yourself to destruction. The punishment that is tasted in the hereafter is nothing more than the materialization of your actions. It's the manifestation of your deeds. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, in ayah number 70, 71, قُلْ أَنَدْعُوا مَا لَا يَنفَعُنَا وَلَا يَضُرُّنَا وَنُرَدُّ عَلَىٰ أَعْقَابِنَا بَعْدِ إِذْ هَدَانَ اللَّهِ كَالَّذِ اسْتَهْوَتْهُ الشَّيَاطِينُ فِي الْأَرْضِ حَيْرَانَ لَهُ أَصْحَابٌ يَدْعُونَهُ إِلَى الْهُدَىٰ اِتِنَا قُلْ إِنَّ هُدَى اللَّهِ هُوَ الْهُدَىٰ وَأُمِرْنَا لِنَسْلَمَ لِرَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ Say, O Muhammad, shall we invoke Instead of Allah, that which neither benefits us nor harms us. You see, this idea of gaining benefit and guarding yourself from harm, this is the basis of all human action. Anything that you do is because you think that there's a benefit for you. And anything that you abstain from, it's because there is a real harm or a perceived harm. Any action that you do, you do it because there is a real benefit or there is at least a perceived benefit. And anything that you refrain from, you're refraining from it either because there's a real harm or there is a perceived harm. Do you expect us to turn our backs, to go back to our state of jahiliyyah? After Allah has guided us, do you want us to regress? Islam has made us progress. Islam has made us civilized. Islam has made us human. Do you want to dehumanize us by making us go back to our value system that we had during the time of Jahiliyyah? Would we then be like the one whom the devils enticed to wander upon the earth confused? While we have companions inviting him to guidance, calling, come to us. You see the difference between the one who turns away from Allah? He's like the one who's following the devils who are enticing him. And he finds himself wandering aimlessly in a desert. Is he like the one who has righteous companions who are inviting him towards piety, who are telling him, come to us? Say indeed the guidance of Allah is the only guidance. The only way to achieve nearness to Allah, to grow as a human being, to attain human perfection, is to follow divine guidance through those who are divinely selected to guide humanity. And we have submitted to the Lord of the words, وَأُمِرْنَا لِنُسْلِمَ لِرَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ And then in ayah number 72, وَأَنْ أَقِيمُ الصَّلَاةِ and establish prayer, and have taqwa, be God conscious, have piety, and to him, and he is the one upon whom you shall return. It's interesting that at the end of ayah 71 and in ayah 72, there are three commandments. The first is what? To submit to the Lord of the worlds. لَنَسْلِمَ لِرَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ 
Fakhrul Razi, who is a Sunni commentator of the Quran, he has a very beautiful insight into these two verses. He says there are three divine commandments here. What is the relationship between these three divine commandments? The first is submit to the Lord of the worlds. Submission is a matter of the heart. Surrender yourself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Have faith in Him. The best action of the heart is submission to Allah. Fakhrul Razi says, the best action of the heart is submission to Allah. The best action of the limbs is what? Prayer, salah, wa an aqimu salah. And then he says, and the best omission of action the best action to refrain from is sin and this is the meaning of taqwa so these three commandments are the best of actions the first action is an action related to the heart the best action of the heart is to have faith in allah the best action of the limbs is salah is prayer the daily prayers and the best actions to refrain from are sins. And this is the meaning of taqwa, to refrain from sin. When you do that, you are prepared to meet your Lord. And He is the one upon whom you shall return. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to bless us and guide us and illuminate our hearts with the teachings of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد. We have some time for a Q and A. If anyone has a question or even a comment. Okay, there's a question from uh, from Muhsin on the subject of who we should sit with. And which gatherings we should avoid it happens sometimes that in the business environment you are invited to business gatherings for so socialization with customers or colleagues where the discussions are not about work what would be the guideline for us if it comes to these, these gatherings that are not that are not avoidable now again the quran and the ahadith are not saying that you should not engage in small talk or friendly conversations with people. Not everything that is discussed has to be related directly to matters of faith. But if you see, for example, colleagues, for example, using vulgar language, if they're, if they're backbiting against fellow colleagues, you need to take a moral stance. You need to say, "Listen, you know, let's let's change the subject. Let's not talk about anyone behind their back." You know, there are there are certain behaviors that even people who are non-Muslim recognize as being immoral. No person, every person knows that to talk behind someone's back is an immoral thing. That to use vul vulgar language is not something that's appropriate so if you're interacting with customers or colleagues and they're engaging in foul language or they're they're speaking about unethical things they're using language that's very offensive you need to try to steer the conversation in a different direction so there's no problem about speaking about matters that are that are, that are related to the dunya there's no problem with that but just make sure that you're not engaging in anything that that is that is immoral or offensive or that is moral or offensive or would be looked at as as something that an a person of integrity you know uh, shouldn't be uh, partaking now there's, There's another question about how we should deal with that as at school if kids are mocking religion and God. You know, if, if that's happening, I think it's important for us to tell our children 
that if there are classmates who are mocking God and are making uh, insensitive comments about our faith or about anyone's faith for that matter, you know, I would personally advise that this issue should be brought to the attention of a teacher or the principal. And perhaps there needs to be a, an assembly at the school about this, that we need to be, you know, uh, courteous. We need to be respectful about, uh, about other people's faith traditions. So I definitely wouldn't, uh, wouldn't let that pass, even if it's at school. Now, I understand that if kids say something, they might be bullied or they might be mocked. So maybe, you know, discreetly, Bring that, bring it to the attention of the parents, or have the child bring it to the attention of the principal or their teacher, and have the teacher address it. Now the question is: What if you were born in a non-religious family? How will Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala judge you? Now, I think this impacts all of us. This is a question that's that's relevant to all of us because even if you're born in a religious family, religious people don't always act religiously, right? You may be in a family where everyone prays, everyone fasts, but when you sit for dinner, it becomes a session of gossip and slandering and backbiting. Your responsibility is, number one, change the subject. If you can change the subject, change the subject. If you cannot... Excuse yourself from that gathering. Remove yourself from that gathering. That's the best thing to do. Now, don't do it in a way that's condescending. You know, it's important for us that when we admonish people, you know, don't project a holier-than-thou complex because that pushes people further away from faith, from Islam. Do it in a very gentle, in a very polite way. Maybe make a joke, just change the subject. You know, find creative ways to steer the conversation in another direction. But, you know, whether you're born in a non-religious family or a religious family, you know, when, when people start using their tongues and their words in a way that's destructive and it's not productive or useful, you know, we should have a zero-tolerance policy when it comes to fruit, fruitless discussions. Well, I have a question about what if uh, you said that the only time you're allowed to talk about to tell people about religion is if you have taqwa. Uh, how do you know if you qualify for that? Well, the the ayah that we were referring to, we were referring to the specific context of the verse was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was speaking about the disbelievers in Mecca who were talking about religion but not for the sake of sincere religious deliberation or they wanted to have you know, a serious dialogue. They were mocking. They were ridiculing. They were speaking about religion in a disrespectful and disparaging way. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the only ones who are permitted to sit in these gatherings with the intention of admonishing are those who have taqwa. Those who can keep their cool, right? Who can control their emotions, who are not going to be, you know, flustered or shaken or influenced by that type of blasphemous uh, dialogue, who have the knowledge to, you know, uh, dispel possible misconceptions that these individuals have. So, how do you know if you're, if you, if you have the knowledge? I mean that goes to each individual. I think it really it's a, it depends on the the people who are in that group. It depends on the topic that's being brought up. So if people are if people are making disrespectful comments about a very technical fiqhi issue, and you're not very you know well versed in Islamic jurisprudence, then in that case you wouldn't be the right person to give an admonishment. So it really depends on the uh, on the situation. I have a question, Malana, um, regarding so if you're in a gathering with people who are maybe talking about something un-Islamic, but they're non-Muslims, and it's not not something 
considered within their society to be immoral. So for example, if people are talking about this wine that they bought and about the layers of chocolate and oak or whatever that they taste in their wine, and people around here having this discussion, is it permissible to just kind of sit there and not share your ideas because you're yes. not hearing it, you're not thinking it, but it's they're not necessarily mocking or they're not. Yeah, yeah, that mocking. that that is permissible as long as as long as the, the prohibition that I've seen in the ahadith and the, in the traditions, you know, if you're sitting with someone who's making fun of the Holy Prophet, you know, God forbid, who's saying that the Prophet is a warmonger, and 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 it, it's one thing if you're if you're talking to someone who's who's just misinformed and who's genuinely interested in having an academic discussion, but if you're sitting with someone who is not interested in in really exploring this concept, who, who's rather just who just wants to attack, you're not allowed, you're not permitted to sit in these gatherings. If you're sitting with someone who, God forbid, is calling the Holy Prophet a pedophile, you know, you're clearly not, you're not to sit in a gathering like that. Someone who is ridiculing or mocking the Imams of the Ahmed Bayt, you remove yourself from that gathering. Now, if you're in a position where there are other people who are listening and you have the knowledge to kind of offer counter arguments, then you do so. But if you're sitting with a group who are like-minded, who are disrespectful, who are rude, who are attacking, you know, religious figures, who are attacking, you know, certain Islamic principles, your job is to remove yourself from that gathering. Otherwise, as the Quran says, you will be counted as among them because your presence is a is a signal of condonement. If you're sitting with people who are uh, who are attacking Islam and attacking. Uh, you know, uh, holy personalities. And so, so just to clarify, so another dimension then isn't just just not to you know just condone by sitting there, but also to not engage in sort of pointless arguments with people as well. Sure. Sure. Okay. Uh, is there? A, could you go into a little bit more into what was meant by vain talk? Is it more? Is it? Go, does it go beyond the whole uh, like insulting the prophet or insulting religion? Now, the, the word level is much more general than uh, than this discussions where you know God's signs, God's messengers are being attacked. Level in the Arabic language is something that should be avoided. Now, is it a sin to engage in level? From a fiqhi perspective, you're not committing a sin if you talk about something that has no benefits. You know, if that's the case, then a lot of us are going to be racking up a lot of sins. Because if you sit with people, oftentimes the conversations that we have with certain individuals fall under the category of level. You know, they're not necessarily useful. Are you committing a sin? No, you're not. But if you want to, to elevate yourself, if you are seeking higher levels of spirituality, then you need to make a habit of avoiding conversations that are fruitless, that are, that are vain, that, that are not productive. Now, as I said, if... There are many times where, you know, I remember when I was in the holy city of Najaf, you know, a lot of times you sit with, you know, some seminary students and then, you know, the conversation goes in another direction and you end up talking about something that has no value. But then what happens is that, you know, sometimes a senior student may join the gathering and they're able to kind of redirect the conversation. So a lot of times you may sit in a gathering where there's lahu, where nothing productive is being discussed but you're the one that is able to generate some thought-provoking conversations something that's you know spiritually uplifting so technically it's not a sin to to engage in vain talk and by level i mean you know discussions that don't bring any harm necessarily but are not necessarily beneficial. But the reason is the Quran wants us to avoid vain talk because vain talk usually leads to 
sinful talk. You know, if you if if you if you're the type of person that is not careful about what they say, gradually fruitless conversations will evolve into destructive and ha harmful conversations. So we have to be on guard. We have to be uh, we have to guard our tongues, as the hadith tell us. You know, subhanallah. You know, it's. Even the way that Allah created the tongue, you know, our ears are on the outside of our bodies, right? Because, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us in a way whereby He wants us to be listeners. He wants us to be good listeners. He wants us to really use this organ. But with the tongue, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has concealed it behind our lips. And He has hidden it behind our teeth and our teeth almost look like a fence like a prison that our that our tongue is housed behind so even in the way that allah has created the tongue the position of the tongue is uh, is something that is really something to think about that it's 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 not meant to be an organ that we use without uh, without consideration without caution And I think I mentioned the hadith maybe last week or the week before where there are hadith that say that the majority of people who enter the hellfire will, will enter it because of their tongues. Because of their tongues. Because of what they, what they heard, what they said, participating in gatherings that they should have avoided. Thank you very much, Shaykh. This was a really good session. Thank you so much, inshallah. Okay. How many more verses do we have? Got about another hundred or so, ninety or hundred left. Inshallah. Now, I was telling one of the uh, one of the brothers that, you know, with the whole Quran, you know, you're never done, right? So, you know, you can study Surah Al-An'am over and over and over, and every time you revisit it, it's as if you're being exposed to it for the first time. The Quran is always fresh, so I. I really hope I'm not I'm not boring you or I'm, you don't feel like I'm going too slow. I'm doing my best to kind of go as quickly as I can, but without compromising the uh, the quality of the uh, the commentary. Hey, thank you very thank much. You so much. We really appreciate. Bless you, inshallah, and uh, keep in your dawn, inshallah. Salaam alaikum.